hello again. Uh, so I'm about to attempt the pretty much the FASA uh, Explorer 1 craft. You know, difference being that I'm using the lower uh, energy first stage because I don't have the second engine version unlocked. But if I aim for a pretty low uh, starting, I guess, altitude, like 150 kilometer to 180, I can, it looks like in a couple of practice tests I was able to get um, pretty much in orbit. And if I'm as close as I was in you know, a couple of my tests, I'm willing to just do a tiny hyper edit tweak to get myself, get my periapsis just above 150. So uh, I wasn't able to pack all those. I think I explained that in the last video, right? Yeah, the, uh, the collider for one of these two parts is a little borked, so they just don't quite sit within each other. But beyond that, I've got a pretty good process down for this. So. 50 meters per second, I go to 88, and then at a, what was it, 30, 30 seconds, just a little over 30 seconds into flight, let's say 35 seconds, I'll go to uh, surface velocity vector plus, and that will be arcing me just a little high, and then I just kind of pull down as the dynamic pressure starts to drop. It's a kind of ascent that I'd pretty easily be able to get programmed in, in KOS, I think, but since I only use this craft just for a couple of specialized missions, it's not really worth it. So there we go. So let's just lock to surface velocity plus. Um, maybe just kind of poke down just a little bit. Because when you wander above, um, when you get above Mach 1, it really starts to lock into that prograde vector. Where all the, I assume if it was showing long aerodynamic force vectors, it would be showing, uh, it would be showing any time you try to wander off center, it really gets forced back. Yeah, the vectors not quite long enough. Yeah, you can see them a little bit there. but So I'm mostly just going to wait until this starts to come down and then just start to force it down a bit more. So I want to aim, so when this first stage burns out, I want this to be between 150 and 180. So that's really all I need to do with this first stage. Because I need it to be, I need my um, kind of the altitude where I'm going to be lighting all these solid stages to be above the atmosphere. And I spin stabilize it before I get there, so you know there's a lot of variables already to be managed. Oh, see the uh, dynamic pressure is coming down enough that I can get pretty far away from the surface prograde there, and the altitude. So the highest, uh, the lowest I was obviously I can go is 150 because that's where the atmosphere starts or ends, whichever direction you're coming from. And 180 uh, in my last test I was still able to get pretty much up into orbit. Oh. So I've only got 16 seconds to spare with this. So the good news is I don't have to like worry about hot staging or anything else. But once this burns out, it just burns out. I just want it to be pretty stable when that happens. Not heading, uh, you know, not pitching like this down or pitching up or anything. So just stabilized, and there we go, perfect. So right in the range I want. It's going to lose a little bit due to, um, you know, due to what the remaining aerodynamic drag. Okay, so now that it's really gone, let's ditch that stage. And now I want to quickly get myself aimed. So what this actually is, you know, what this is, is going to change as we do the arc from here to here during the next, what, minute, uh, minute and a half, two minutes, it looks like. So that's why I'm pitching, getting it down to minus one degree. And now I have that amount of time to spin this up. So not quite the way it was done historically. Historically, these upper stages, which we want to be spinning, were already spinning at the ground. Uh, as strange as that sounds. Just because it's such a light package compared to the rest, the rest of it hardly even notices. And as long as you have these, these upper stages like well balanced and on a bearing or something, they can be spinning at launch and still be spinning up at this stage. And so really then you would just have pulsed the RCS jets to kind of get it aimed right in the direction you want. Uh, so the minus one degree was because, you know, during this minute or two of coast, um, Basically, the Earth is going to move around us. Even though we're pointed in the same direction, like let's say if we were pointed right at a star, the Earth is moving around uh, below us. And so it's going to move just a degree or two during that time. Whereas I want to be pretty much pointed right at zero when the, when the actual burn happens. And so that's why I'll be lighting these engines at just a little bit different times relative to that. Because ultimately I want my final impulse to happen right while I'm not traveling uphill or downhill or not pitched really anything, and so I'll have to compensate a little bit uh, because this is going to be pitched. It looks like about a degree above the uh, above uh, the exact horizon. So that means I'll want to burn while I'm heading downwards just a little bit because 
this means that some of my velocity is going to be vertical. It's going to be, as I burn this, is going to put me moving uphill just a little bit. Another good step, a good news, is that I can wait between each of these stages. You know, even if it's just a few seconds, that gives me a lot of control. So you can see the first stage pretty much hasn't moved at all, just a little bit of decoupler force during this coast. All right, so ready to start igniting these stages. Uh, wish me luck. Actually, I'll quick save just in case I might want to use that instead of hyper edit. Okay, so when we're pretty much here, there we go. So we're going to ignite this set, and you can see everything fly away really quickly because these solid stages have really high thrust to weight. So we're still heading downhill, so let's light the next one. And then I might have a little bit of a delay until I start heading down again. Because whatever this value is, and wherever I am when I light the stage, and kind of how it averages out, so I'm going to wait until I'm going down, like let's say 10. There we go. And see, I probably should have waited a little longer, see, kind of to split the difference, to make this orbit a bit more circular. But whoa, crazy camera swing because I'm on auto mode, but it looks like I actually hit. See, so over 150, that's the minimum uh, altitude, and extend antenna. So even with the lower, the you know, the lower energy first stage, I just barely have enough margin to get into orbit. You'll have a lot more luck. It'll be a lot easier to do uh, if you use the high dyne first stage. But thankfully, I didn't need to do that. So contract complete. Very very nice payoff in both reputation and cash. And that reputation should, I, I believe, reputation ties to what contracts you're offered. Uh, and there's unfortunately not really any science to be gained for me here. Uh, I'm going to probably pass above some uh, biomes that I've never passed over before, like the desert. So I'll stick with the craft until then. But really, that was kind of my whole goal of this video, because I kind of have to plan what to do next a bit still. See, after you get Explorer into orbit, I was doing a little bit of research. You know, I need to kind of refresh myself on the historical order of things. And it looks like, say, Explorer 6 was fired by a, let's see, what was it, a Thor Abel. Thor DM-18 Able 3, which is n nothing like anything I currently have, uh, October 6, 1959. And so that's the, kind of the, same, the next thing I'll be uh, aiming for, something that um, potentially like leaves Earth's gravity well. Uh, and, you know, whatever contracts give me cash. But yeah, the next thing I need to do is to uh, like aim for specific orbits, um, like now I have just a basic object in orbit and look how light it is like with this spent um, a solid kick motor that finally got me into the final orbit it's I've just got what 14 kilograms into orbit so we've got a lot uh, a lot of uh, things to do before we can actually put you know a human being into orbit uh, but yeah that's my first satellite in orbit and I, that's what, one thing I really like about RSS realism overhaul RP0 etc like what, what, this is like video 10, 11, something like that. So like it took, takes kind of quite a bit of planning and design and ability just to put the tiniest thing into orbit. And I can't control this, right? I can't, this can't go do anything else. All it could do was just barely reach Earth orbit. But now, you know, it's going to stay in, in within RSS and everything as it is now. It's going to stay up here forever, uh, which is awesome. It's, and it was my Explorer 1 probe. It was my first attempt uh, outside of a simulation to actually put this into orbit. And this is how this craft is actually stabilized, right? It uh, was kept like that. But in practice, with an orbit like this, with the low point of 150 kilometers or so, this might stay in orbit for, you know, a week, maybe, a couple weeks, if that. Um, and then it would be pulled down because, you know, every time we're near our low point here, um, in, in, in reality, you'd be brushed by a bit of atmosphere and you'd lose a little velocity and that would bring down your AP until eventually you, you, know, you, you uh, have fallen into the atmosphere. But there we go. That is my first craft uh, to achieve orbit. Uh, so I'm going to warp, I'm going to keep an eye on these because I haven't passed over a desert before, I don't think. Uh, and I, I, rec I noted a bug on the realism overhaul because there's, you know, there's so many parts, there's so many things you do with them. I, you know, you don't notice every bug every time. Ooh, there we go, up to warp 100. Uh, but I noticed that it wasn't consuming electricity as I, when I was transmitting science with this specific core. Oh, nice, it popped me out of warp. That is awesome. Don't recall offhand which mod did that, probably this lovely little one. And 
See, so I've gathered science, it's reporting transmission, and if you've looked at you know, my previous missions where I was transmitting science, a little bit of electric charge should be getting chunked out, should be getting consumed as I transmit each of those experiments. But that's not happening with this probe core. And, and I honestly don't know enough about that uh, to know how to fix it myself. All I can really do is register and kind of wait until like Sir Kaplan or Nathan Kell or somebody else with that expertise who knows what needs to be changed comes around. But in the meantime, we get to observe uh, Earth from orbit. So it's the first time in this career mode, in this career here, that I've been able to just kind of view Earth, and view things from my craft and relax, which is nice. Everything else has been this rush, rush to stage, hot stage, plan, etc. But here, huh, thankfully this thing is just going to be in orbit and dancing away forever. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'll be passing over a desert. Yeah, it looks like we might pass over something interesting down there. So I'll, I mean, I can, I'll spend a little bit of time here to kind of talk about orbit. So around here, we're going to be passing over the equator. Um, now, you know, if I want to put something in um, a geostationary or a geosynchronous orbit, those are, those are different things. Um, if I had, you know, a more powerful upper stage here, like an Agena, like if, you know, future things I'll be building, around this point where I'm over the equator, I'd obviously set up some, some readouts so I could tell right when I was there, I would burn uh, to raise my apoapsis, raise the opposite point of my orbit, way up to 36,000 kilometers, so very high. And then once that burn was complete, whatever payload I had left at that other point, I would want to burn to make to remove this tilt so that instead of being angled relative to the equator of the Earth, it was a belt right over the equator of the Earth, and also raise this point of my orbit up to 36,000 kilometers or so. Yeah, there's precise numbers you can look up, and the orbit uh, orbital period is important as well. But that's going to be one of the uh, future upcoming missions in the career here. And that's a pretty tricky mission. The Americans did it with a surprisingly small satellite, if I recall correctly, Syncom was the first uh, satellite geostationary, whereas the Soviets did not do it until much, much later. But uh, part of the real challenge there is uh, the angle of this, uh, of this orbit kind of depends on where you launch from. And you know, the larger the angle is, the more difficult it is to straighten it along the equator. And because the Soviet launch sites are so much further north than you know, Kennedy Space Center is, it's much, much harder to put up a geostationary satellite from uh, the Soviets' available launch sites. Uh, but yeah, there's just all kinds of interesting facts about orbits. And so if you imagine, you can think about this belt, this orbit, being stationary relative to the Earth, but the Earth is rotating underneath it. So, you know, actually, I'll, I'll um, do a quick warp here, see if it not, didn't stop me on any science. Okay, so we'll go around. Oh, okay, we're over a desert of some kind here. So let's grab some science. So the Earth is actually rotating away underneath us. Come on, transmit science. I hear there might be a bug relating to trying to transmit while you're uh, at time warp. Uh, so I'll let those finish before I go back to time warp. And if you see, if you take a look, obviously, you know, um, the day, the day, uh, night time has made it a little difficult to see there. But here, let me double click on the Earth. So now it's focusing on the Earth and not on the craft. So as the craft comes around, notice that the Earth is rotating around, but the orbit isn't. And so I'm not going to pass directly over my launch site. And the more time, oh, Earth's mountains, okay, get a little more science from this. It's kind of whack-a-mole-like stock, unfortunately, but it's a good way to spread out the science. So you only really can easily get this science when you are in orbit like this. There we go. So soon enough I'll be passing. So right now I'm passing over, like, what, Mexico, Texas, one of those areas. And then there we go. We can see the Gulf of Mexico come up. So I'm not going to pass right over where I launched from because the Earth has or you know, has rotated a substantial amount underneath me since I launched. And every time I orbit, that's going to be true. More and more, uh, the Earth will have orbited, have moved around more and more each time. 
There we go. So we can see Florida in general, but we're not going to be passing near the launch site where we were at. And every time around, we're going to be further and further away from being right overhead of where we launched. And uh, so that makes it really tricky to launch something. If I, if, you know, if I was at the gr on the ground now, it'd be very tricky and expensive to try to launch something to, you know, to, to meet up with this, to rendezvous in orbit. Uh, and that is a very difficult process that I hope to automate with my KOS script eventually, because I want to launch things from you know, Kennedy Space Center over a period of days, months, uh, year, or to rendezvous in orbit, to build up a craft that I can you know, do uh, large missions with, rather than sending them up in one big launch, because I find on-orbit construction interesting. Uh, but yeah, there we go. So that was the f our first orbit. Uh, notice pretty much whatever you're, uh, you know, if you're kind of in these lower Earth orbits like this, pretty much takes an hour and a half to come around every time. An hour and a half to do a full orbit of the entire Earth, which seems like a long time if you have to live through every second, but obviously we have time warp, which is nice, but you know, 90 minutes to go an entire trip around the Earth. So thanks for watching the launch there. Really glad that first one was successful. Now I've got to do a, a little bit of uh, research to figure out what I want to build next or what contracts uh, that unlocks for me. So I look forward to showing that off uh, soon. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.